I've got a question for you. Specifically, you. Is it raining outside? Since you're an HAI viewer, I assume you haven't been outdoors in several hours. So to see if it's raining, you could either pop outside, which would get you instant 100% certainty, or you could rely on all the satellites, weather balloons, reporting stations, predictive models, and wet reporters behind your weather app and just hope they're right. If you really want the right answer, do you trust their models, or do you just go outside? Okay, here's another question. If the United States fired a nuclear weapon tomorrow, would it work? Like the rain question, there's a simple, certain way to find out. Detonate a nuke and see how it goes. But we don't do that anymore. So how do we know for certain that all 5,000 nukes we have laying around are in working condition? How do we sit in the windowless room and know it's not raining? The answer, it turns out, is a patchwork system involving some insanely powerful computers, the world's most intense laser, and something called the Z-Machine. Because, of course that's the answer. This is America. But why bother? I'm not planning to use my Walkman again, so I don't spend millions upon millions of dollars to make sure it works. The short answer is deterrence. If all the other nuclear powers thought our nukes didn't work, they might just nuke us. And nuclear weapons aren't even 100 years old, so we have no idea how quickly they degrade or whether they still go boom after a few idle decades in the stockpile. Will the nuclear pit, the part with all the plutonium and stuff, ignite correctly? What about the conventional explosives that trigger the nuclear reaction? Are the structural parts holding everything together tight enough? Could old bombs survive modern counterattacks? If we didn't have, or rather if other countries didn't think we had answers for all those questions and more, it'd be like not having nukes at all. From 1945 to 1992, the United States officially tested 1,054 nukes, each one a warning shot to our enemies and also a valuable source of data on how the weapons work, which they got, by the way, by filling nukes with tens of millions of dollars worth of sensors to live transmit data on what was happening inside the bomb until it exploded and turned the sensors to dust. So the data stopped right when things got interesting, but at least the sensors died doing what they loved. Anyway, various treaties in Cold War times limited how powerful a bomb you could test and ban tests on the surface, underwater, and in outer space, leaving only two usable locales, underground and Narnia. The latest treaty, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, bans all nuclear explosions for any reason and has been on the scene since the 90s, though not technically in effect because the exact countries you'd expect won't ratify it. Nevertheless, the US hasn't detonated a nuclear weapon, even for a test, since September 1992, likely because our our physicists heard Radiohead's new single Creep and were like, what the hell am I doing here? In the absence of nuking Narnia, the US's stockpile stewardship program relies on three things to make sure everything is ship shape. Theory, simulations, and experiments. Theory is just making some guesses. Who cares? Simulations are making computer models that predict how the bombs would do with math. Lots and lots of math. Math about every one of those thousands of parts of the bomb, the materials they're made of, and how they respond to different scenarios. Want to see how a nuke would handle being struck by lightning? There's a code suite for that. And running all that code takes a lot of computational power. I mean, it nearly kills my laptop to run The Sims. The nuclear Sims is a whole other story. Los Alamos National Laboratory runs their simulations on the world's 38th fastest supercomputer, which they've named Trinity after the first successful nuclear test, aka the time they got us into this mess. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory over in California simulates on Sierra, currently the world's 10th fastest supercomputer. These two also each hold a backup of the other's data because, look, it's not like anyone expects them to lose all their data in, say, a nuclear attack, but it would be embarrassing. So, backups. But even the best stat models can't know more than humans do. That's why ChatGPT knows who painted the Mona Lisa, but not who built Stonehenge. Both aliens, BT dubs. To improve nuclear simulations, scientists can't just build super -er computers or more intricate models. The models hunger for real experimental data, which researchers get by, for example, firing a mega laser, spinning nukes really fast, and blasting stuff to smithereens in a place called beef. All of which, to be clear, is exactly what I hoped my taxes were doing. The National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore is home to the world's most powerful laser, which they use to heat itsy-bitsy target materials to over 5.4 million degrees Fahrenheit, or also really freaking hot Celsius. The 192 lasers and X-ray radiation they fire at the targets show them how the material responds to high levels of heat and radiation, which helps simulate, say, how an exterior nuke casing made out of that material would respond to an attack from another country's missile defense system. They also fire the big laser at diamond capsules full of hydrogen isotopes to get a fusion reaction 
reaction cooking, but not so much of a fusion reaction that it destroys everything. Just enough, at a small enough scale, to see how nuclear fusion works, which can then inform how they model it in simulations. They also study nuclear fusion at Sandia National Laboratory using something called the Z-Machine, which fires an electric pulse with the strength of a thousand lightning bolts at a target a bit bigger than the pad of your thumb, which can get as hot as 3 billion degrees Fahrenheit, or also crazy hot Celsius. Firing up the Z-Machine shakes the whole ground at Sandia, so they're only allowed to do it once a day. But not all non-nuclear nuclear testing happens with such little targets. At Los Alamos, they have a big steel tube at the back where they go bomb v bomb by putting nuclear warheads at one end of the tube with the nuclear pit subbed out, and 100 pounds of C4 at the other, then blow it up to see what happens. Elsewhere, they've got a centrifuge that whips plutonium-less warheads around at 200 rotations per minute to make sure all the parts can withstand the 12 g-forces they might experience upon re-entry into the atmosphere. Then in Nevada, there's BEEF, which stands for Big Explosives Experimental Facility, which has quickly unseated WUI as my favorite acronym. Here they blast the non-nuclear parts of a nuke to approximate how those parts would respond to being nuked. All these tests, the big drama ones, alongside countless others that study every little aspect of what's happening in a nuke, down to how the very atoms in the nuclear pit are moving around its surface, come together in the simulations to give us a model so good that when Congress or whoever taps the nerds on the shoulder and says, hey, can I tell North Korea our nukes work? The nerds can be like, yeah. And maybe it's silly to dump this level of time, money, and expertise into something we're planning to literally never use again. Or maybe it's not. That's why I've hired several thousand more HI writers to crank out a million video scripts a week. We're never going to make them, but I'm thinking just the threat will keep real-life lore at bay a little longer. So testing a nuke without blowing it up is wildly expensive, mind-bendingly complicated, and more than a little messy. You know what else is like that? Eating dinner. Unless you use this video's sponsor, Factor. Factor is a service that drops fresh, never frozen, ready to eat meals right at your doorstep. Because here's the thing. Cooking at home is healthy and cost effective, but it also takes forever. I'm only okay at it, and cleaning frying pans is annoying. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have takeout, which is delicious, but also not great for you or your wallet. But in the perfect happy middle, that'd be Factor. I've been subscribing to them for real for ages, because on weeks when I don't have time to cook a box from their parent company HelloFresh, they keep me eating at home despite my busy schedule. Check out this pasta with green beans they sent. That's cavatappi. That's the best pasta shape. And I can confirm, it tasted great. So whether you're trying to waste less on takeout, or make sure you eat a real meal in a busy week, or have some other dinner-related goal you're trying to meet, give Factor a try. Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code HAI50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next box.